Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chuck Jennison, and I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician at the University of Iowa. And um, my, uh, we're going to talk a little, or I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our our new ATV simulator that uh, received that we received uh, funding from Safer Sim to uh, to improve and uh, do a project with, which we really appreciate. Um, my co-investigator um, in this project is Salam Ramatala. And unfortunately, he's sick today and won't be able to join us. So I'm going to present his part of the presentation as well today. Um, I would like to thank uh, other people, members of our team. Um, uh, which includes uh, Jake Michael, a graduate student, uh, postgrad Jonathan Deshaw, uh, undergraduates Kyle Losek and Ulysses Grant. Yes, it's his real name. And are all from the uh, College of Engineering here at the University of Iowa. And also Doreen Denning, who's uh, on the research staff in the emergency department um, uh, here as well with, and works with me with a lot of a number of projects. So I, I want to first start out with just giving, talking a little bit about ATVs and giving some background about some of the risk factors and how our, we might be able to investigate those problems with uh, an ATV simulator. So ATVs were first introduced in the 1970s. The first one was a three-wheeler uh, that was introduced by Honda um, in 1970. Uh, and the first four-wheeler actually was, was um, made, come, came to the market in 1979 by Suzuki. You can see these vehicles were relatively small engines. Uh, the the, uh, the three-wheeler 90cc engine, the Suzuki four-wheeler was 125cc engine. And so they're very much smaller than a lot of the vehicle ATVs that we have today. But still, the general design of these are pretty much the same. They have a straddle seat, low pressure tires, a relatively narrow wheelbase, and high center of gravity, which makes them a little more at risk for a rollover. And in the 1980s, the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, started developing some concerns related to the safety of these issues and implemented a 10-year consent decree that was between the Consumer Product Safety Commission and ATV manufacturers that had a number of kind of rules and regulations, but the main one is that it resulted in the ban of three-wheeled ATVs. And this has occurred in 1988, and despite the fact that that was almost 30 years ago, these vehicles are still around and are still we're still seeing deaths related to them. So these vehicles have a long shelf life and have a potential to cause problems for a long time. Uh, after the expiration of the consent decree in 1998, Really, ATV injuries and deaths soared. The estimated deaths rose from 289 in 1998 to 924 in 2005. More recently, uh, in 2014, uh, estimated 674 deaths in the United States. Uh, uh, we've been really concerned for a long time about the safety issues related to ATVs and kids. Uh, in fact, more U.S. children less than 16 years of age are killed each year in the United States uh, from ATV related events than from bicycle crashes and most people kind of find that hard to believe uh, everybody's riding bikes and potentially getting hit by cars but really more kids die uh, on ATVs less than 16 years and even if you look at 16, 17, 18 those a lot of kids are getting are killed in that age group and having serious injuries so I'm going to make a little plug about uh, a program a school-based ATV safety program that uh, our University of Iowa ATV Safety Task Force uh, does it's called safety tips for ATV riders or the stars program so far we've uh, taught over 15,000 children in Iowa schools uh, targeting 12 to 15 year olds and provides education about safe ATV behaviors based on our 10 stars which include always wear your helmet one person at a time ride the right size machine always wear your protective gear never ride on the road take a safety course, tell someone where you're going, respect private property, never use alcohol or drugs, and always obey the rules. So um, with this program, we do uh, research, both effectiveness of the program and also just related to ATV exposure. And we did publish the almost first 5,000 students who participated in 30 Iowa schools and included both rural and urban youth. In fact, 27% were actually from an urban school. Now, urban Iowa is very much different than downtown urban Chicago or New York, but still a lot of these kids, are, not all these kids were living on farms. And still um, over three quarters of the kids had been on an ATV. And of those that had been on ATV, almost 40% reported riding weekly. Moreover, 
we asked them about their crash experience, which we uh, basically defined as being rolling the vehicle over, hitting something, or falling off being ejected from the vehicle. And 57% reported that they had been in an ATV crash. It's a lot of potential for serious injuries and even deaths. So one of the problems with this uh, is that ATVs, it's very easy to just go on and jump on the vehicle and push the throttle. Anybody can do that. Um, but it takes a lot of physical and mental maturity, cognitive uh, functioning to really operate them correctly. So through this uh, um, program, I'm going to provide, uh, just show some YouTube videos um, that kind of illustrate some of the points I'm trying to make. So here we've got a, a child who's probably less than six years of age, on a youth size ATV, probably designed for kids that are six to 11 years of age. And she's just driving it, no problem. And, uh, you know, just a simple thing is like, maybe you should stop before hitting something is uh, not something that they necessarily can do. Um, Here's another one. Here's a girl who's probably about 11 years of age. She's on an adult size ATV. And we're going to talk a little bit about active riding and how that plays a really important part in operating ATVs. Um, but with little kids, they just sit on it and the ATV operates on them. They don't really operate that vehicle. So you can see she's going to get to go over a little bump. So fortunately, she happened to just hit on the very front part of her helmet, and she had a helmet on. But um, you can see just a relatively little dip in the in the uh, terrain there, and it's kind of catapulting her. So youth operators have about a 12 times greater risk of injury compared to adults, and so children and teens on ATVs are a big concern. But um, the rate increase in ATV-related injuries and deaths in adults really far surpassed that of children in the 2000s, a decade before this one. Um, and there's about 100 to 125,000 ED visits each year for ATV-related events and uh, probably over 400,000 injuries per year in the United States related to ATVs. Now, some of this is because of the increasing size of ATVs before 1998. Most ATVs had engine displacements of 300 cc's or less. I showed you what the initial ATV size were only 90 and 125 cc engines. But after 1998, engine size of vehicle weight you know, increased dramatically. Um, so we have models now that are up to 1,000 cc engines, weigh over 800 pounds. They can travel well over 60 miles per hour. Um, there's virtually no adult size ATVs that travel less than 40 miles per hour. So this has made them, of course, more popular, especially with young adults, males, um, and also, you know, better for work purposes. So we see a lot of farms and other uh, work settings where ATVs have become an important part of the work arsenal. Um, now, the problem with the weight, increasing weight and speed is that uh, if you roll over and the vehicle hits you or even just the forces that are generated by driving such a vehicle, you know, the vehicle is going to hit you with a greater force if, you, if it rolls on top of you. And also, there's a greater likelihood of being trapped under the vehicle during a rollover. So uh, sometimes when you lose control, about the only way you can protect yourself on an ATV is actually to self-eject and clear yourself from the vehicle. Um, that's harder to do when you're having a bigger vehicle like that. Um, also, if it rolls on top of you, you just can't get that vehicle off. And this has been kind of shown from the Consumer Product Safety Commission fatality database that an increasing percentage of people are dying from compression asphyxia. Um, so I'm going to just show you this video. Here's a kid who set up his little video camera because he's going up the hillside. But it kind of falls on top of him. And fortunately, it's not right across his chest and across, or across his neck. And he's kind of, but it's, you're going to see that it's going to take him a long time to really just even rotate this vehicle and, and be able to get himself from, out from underneath it. Um, but so a lot of times if people are, you know, driving out by themselves, it rolls on top of them. Uh, they just can't get it off them and basically die of compression asphyxia. So uh, a lot of these uh, deaths and injuries are, occur in non-collision events, uh, usually a rollover or ejection from the vehicle. And a lot of this has to do with the stability of the vehicle. 
Um, we're gonna I'm gonna show a quick video here of uh, kind of got this little homemade little track here somewhere, and uh, got a kid going on. His his buddy's uh, uh, getting a little uh, dust as he's filming them, and. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> it's you know that this is not unusual for people to lose control on these, and sometimes these things are uh, much more serious than what happened here in this video. Well, passengers uh, are a problem. Most traditional ATVs are designed and recommended for use by one person only. They all they all have warning labels specifically stating that there should be no passengers. Um, however, this is uh, not something that's necessarily followed by users. In our first 5,000, almost 5,000 students that we uh, did the STARS program with, 92% said they had ridden with passengers. So uh, ATVs require active riding. Uh, that means that operators must really rapidly assess changes in the vehicle stability, adjust their body position and grip and footing to compensate. Uh, this is particularly true when there's a sudden or unexpected change in terrain or an obstacle is encountered. Um, and failure to perform proper, proper active riding makes loss of control, ejection, and vehicle rollover more likely. So uh, if you're going downhill, one of the things you need to do is extend your arms and shift your buttocks rearward. That keeps the operator's center of gravity behind the front wheels and helps prevent front rollovers. If you're going uphill, a forward lean with bending the arms is usually sufficient uh, weight shifting. That helps keep that operator's center of gravity ahead of the rear tires, helps prevent backward rollovers. In fact, if you're going a little more significant incline, the actual recommendation is to stand up and lean forward. That helps you provide a little better position uh, to um, uh, change your position for quick changes in a um, uh, position to facilitate active riding and to absorb shock forces. And if you're doing a side hill, you want to lean into the hill you know, to try to compensate for that. Well, passengers really complicate and even prevent these kind of weight shifting needs. A passenger in front of the rider, like a child, will not allow the rider to lean forward when going uphill. And the passenger behind the rider will prevent the rider to move back on the seat when heading downhill. And both of these scenarios really increase the probability of a rollover. Now passengers or operators with passengers uh, compose about 30% of all US ATP fatalities as uh, we did a study on the Consumer Product Safety Commission fatality database. And about over one fifth of the University of Iowa ATB patients um, that were injured from 2002 to 2013 were passengers or operators with passengers. So I'm going to just demo show this video to kind of demonstrate a little bit about problems with pass our passengers. So here they're going over a makeshift uh, ramp, um, but here we got uh, two girls on a, a ATV um, and. You can see that the type of shifting that and, and control that she needs to do with her own body, she can't do when she has a passenger. So she's fortunate she didn't have a more serious head injury. Um, uh, in the YouTube, they don't usually show videos that where people have something serious or die. Um, but uh, um, kind of illustrate some of the problems with passengers. Well, we did a, uh, on our data from the University of Iowa, we looked at ATV rollovers that found that on slope terrain, they're more likely to have passengers than rollovers on other or unknown terrain. Uh, backward rollovers were over twice as likely to have passengers as all other rollovers. And here I'm going to show a video. We're going uphill. It's fairly steep. They know they need to shift forward, so they try to do so. But it's just not quite enough to be able to do prevent this from happening. So there's plenty of people to try to get this ATV off of them. But of course, uh, they're going to close in and you're going to hear that she has a back injury. She's crying. Got hit in the mouth. Another thing with uh, 
passengers, we found that falls ejections to the rear were nearly eight times more likely to have passengers on the ATV than other types of ejection, and more likely to have passengers than non-ejections. So, um, yeah, you shouldn't be riding with passengers. You can see how that ATV is also they activate, acting, acting on them instead of them being able to act and absorb those forces. But with a person on the back, what can happen is uh, basically they get ejected off the back. Um, and so she's fortunate enough that they weren't going at great speed and she's able to put out her arms behind her to try to protect her head. This is one of the problems with being ejected to the rear at uh, you know faster speeds and forces. And our University of Iowa data, this is a kid who got, uh, had this basically happen to him on an ATV, um, that falls ejections to the rear had worse head injury scores than side ejections or self ejections. So it's really hard to protect your head if you get thrown backwards. You know, if you're getting thrown to the side, you can take out your arm, try to protect your head. Um, but it's a lot harder to do that when you're, you're falling out backwards. Uh, not surprisingly, patients who had self-ejected or were ejected to the side experienced worse extremity injuries. So they're putting out their arms and often getting a significant um, upper arm fracture or other kind of injury. So here is a patient who is losing control. You know, he'll jumps off to try to save himself. You can see he kind of extends his arm to kind of protect him. One thing about YouTube, you get videos from all over. Speaking French here. <laughs> so, um, so passengers increase the center of gravity, height, and shift of center of gravity backwards. Um, and passengers distract the drivers from their need to continually survey the environment to avoid obstacles, observe train changes, anticipate active riding requirements. Um, we've seen uh, that on uh, highway increased number percentage of uh, roadway deaths with passengers, probably because they're going to distract not only all the other things we're talking about as far as center of gravity, but distraction makes a big, and especially for kids, that's uh, they're easily distracted anyway. I want to talk just a little bit about roadway crashes before I kind of move on from this portion of the discussion. Um, despite only a small fraction of ATV riding occurring on roadways, over 60% of all ATV fatalities in the United States occur on public roads. Um, that's a lot. This is, um, since 1998, in fact, roadway deaths have increased at a much greater rate than those off-road. In the 2000s, it was like basically at two times the rate of uh, increase in roadway deaths versus off-road. Now, it is true, uh, roadway crashes are more likely to involve a collision with another motor vehicle, about 10 times more for fatalities and five times more for injuries versus crashes that occur off-road. But uh, despite this, over two-thirds of roadway fatalities and an even greater percentage of roadway injuries are not related to collisions with another vehicle. So they're just single vehicle crashes. So the thing is that all-terrain is really a misnomer. These are not all terrain. They're not designed for roadway use. Manufacturers specifically state that these vehicles should not be used on the road in their owner manuals, on warning labels, on the machines, but that doesn't mean people follow that. Um, now, as I said, they're not designed for a road. So they have this high center of gravity, narrow wheelbase, which makes them much more likely to roll over. Um, and their tires are very much different. So roadway tires is, are designed to continually grip and release the roadway surface. But AT ATV tires, these off-road tires, are designed to grab terrain um, and are not really, they don't really easily release the terrain surface um, that they grab. And so, um, and so uh, you get this really unpredictable interaction of the tires with the roadway surface. Um, we have had, uh, you know, people uh, uh, recently, there was a, a woman here in Iowa who was pregnant with twins, about seven or eight weeks, or eight months pregnant, riding with a child. And bystander said, I don't know, all of a sudden she just decided, you know, turned to the right real suddenly and flipped the vehicle over. Now, she wasn't really just turning the vehicle you know, over quickly on purpose. What happens is that those tires grab the surface and all of a sudden she's turning to the right not because she wanted to. Um, so um, I'm going to go into that a little further. So uh, the other thing about these vehicles is that they have a solid rear axle or a fixed rear differential. Um, so unlike a roadway vehicle, 
um, where the inside tire travels slower than the outside tire, so you can make a turn or a curve a little bit easier and quicker. Uh, these most of these vehicles don't have that, and so they back the t tires are traveling at the same speed, so it's much more difficult to make uh, a turn or a curve. And on the roadway speeds, that makes it even more difficult. So people either end up not making that curve and going off the road and rolling over or hitting something or trying to make the turn and rolling it over right on the roadway surface. You know, so despite this, uh, ATVs on driving on public roads is really frequently done. They're looking at our, just our kids, 11 to 16 years of age in Iowa, 81% um, said they had driven an ATV on a public road. So here's an ATV uh, video from YouTube. And you'll see this guy, he just kind of shifts a little bit his weight. All of a sudden the vehicle grabs and uh, he kind of like just looks like he gets up a little bit to kind of adjust his bottom. And he kind of one as the one wheel starts grabbing, he starts having can't he kinda ends up going out to the outside, he grabs more and just flips the vehicle over. And he's really just is a very gentle uh, and they really don't look like they're speeding. They look like they're going uh, at a gentle curve there. And yet um, all of a sudden he's lost control and is in the ditch with the vehicle on top of them. So there's been a recent trend of legislation across the country allowing increased ATV access to public roads, especially secondary roads that are unpaved, but uh, even on paved roads as well. Uh, we find this a really a bad kind of trend. Um, almost uh, even this unpaved roads, 43% of all roadway deaths are on unpaved roads. So it's not just a paved road problem, this interaction with the surface and, and uh, problems that can occur. So, um, well, we felt that investigating risk factors for ATV-related injuries in the field, well, uh, we think that, but it is, uh, significant ethical concerns and technical challenges of trying to really look at these issues and felt that simulators could provide a safe and effective solution in trying to really investigate these factors. So. To date, um, our team is really the only group that's reported having using an ATV simulator to study active riding by human subjects. Um, our very first uh, um, grant was from the University of Iowa Injury Prevention Research Center. And I'm going to just show briefly what we did with our previous simulator. Um, we bought an ATV, stripped of its engine and tires, and then welded the base to a heavy steel frame. Um, tension springs were used to maintain resistance of the handlebars uh, turning mechanism. We made adjustments. Uh, to allow for proper throttle, throttle and brake recoil. And then we mounted this on top of a six degree of freedom man rated electric motion system platform. So this Moog electric motion system platform is housed at the Center for Computer Aided Design at the uh, University of Iowa um, College of Engineering. And this uh, system produces vibration frequency up to 20 hertz and accelerations up to 15 meters per second squared. It generates movement up to 40 centimeters in the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical directions, and up to 20 degrees of roll, pitch, and yaw angular motion. So um, the platform movements uh, then and, and vibration were computer generated and were kind of based uh, on instrumented field vehicles. And these vibrations were used as physical distraction as well as to mimic the natural vehicle vibration. Um, we use additional program programming to produce acute angular platform movements and to simulate sudden changes in the terrain. So we had a pitch program that had acute changes in incline decline. We had a roll program that so mimicked side to side um, changes like uh, being in a side hill or a ditch. And then each ride file contained the three sudden pitch or roll movements which we did measurements from. And so our objective was really to study, to determine whether, um, uh, kind of measure the dynamic response of ATV riders to sudden simulated terrain changes and to provide proof of principle that we could measure active riding, which we described earlier. So we had five subjects. They were 18 to 45 years of age. Um, we decided to use uh, people that had, were experienced riders, uh, which we defined as having greater than or equal to 100 years hundred years, yeah. <laughs> that would be long. hundred hours of ATV experience. And uh, um, they, uh, they had to wear a helmet with a face shield, long pants, and closed shoes. Uh, we put uh, 24 reflective markers on the subjects and four on the vehicle. 
Um, there were accelerometers that were placed on the helmet, um, at the neck, at the seventh cervical vertebrae on the ATV, as, also, as well as on the platform. Um, subjects, were asked to re subjects were asked to react to the simulator movements as they would if they were operating an actual ATV. And then the subjects were run through a series of these um, simulator uh, ride files, uh, which included a repetition of the pitch and roll programs with a brief recovery period between each ride. So we weren't very sophisticated with this vehicle uh, at, at that time, our simulator. The, we used a movie of an ATV riding through a wooded area on the wall that would kind of serves as a visual focus for the subject during the testing. However, what was seen on the on the screen wasn't really had any kind of relationship to what was happening with on the uh, on the simulator platform itself. Really, no visual cues of potential acute simulated terrain changes. Although that did allow for us to observe the operator responses to unexpected ATV movement. So I'm just going to show a little short video of of uh, somebody in the role portion of this uh, uh, simulator ride and. Um, one of the problems I'm going to mention is that you can see that when they go to a roll, it kind of oscillates back and forth instead of just kind of rolling to the side and coming back. Um, the programming of the platform didn't allow just for it moving out and then coming back. So we had to kind of allow it to oscillate back and get to a kind of a neutral position and then uh, put another roll in and into it. And it wasn't, you know, obviously what would be very real to life. Um, oops. Sorry about that. So with that, uh, this is just kind of showing the motion capture data that would be able to be collected with that. Um, so again, this is a roll uh, ride. And those little dots don't look like much, uh, but uh, you can also kind of put a skeleton over that and you can get a little better idea of what, what's happening uh, with the person as they're um, riding the, the simulator. So analyzing data, we took the Cartesian locations of the subjects uh, and simulator markers um, that were exported and analyzed with NIH approved visual 3D software, uh, a line running through the seventh cervical vertebrae reflective marker and the midpoint between the pelvic markers were used to determine changes over time in the angle of the subject's torso during upward pitch, downward pitch, and during a roll. So for each ride, subject movement was average for three identical sudden vehicle movements, and the values were plotted over time. So I'm going to just show you just uh, the upward pitch data. Um, so you can see there's this gray line. That's basically the movement of the platform of the ATV as it went into a sudden uh, upward pitch. And then uh, the, do the solid line is an average of three identical uh, pitch movements for ride one. And then the dotted line is, again, th the average of three identical, identical, identical upward pitch movements for ride two. And you can see there's some differences between each of, uh, so each of these are graphs as a su different subject uh, and their responses to it. So the average maximum angle for three sudden simulator movements during a ride was determined. And we found that the average torso shifting increased from ride one to ride two, about six degrees. So you can see a graph how they all increased um, from the first ride to the second ride. And if um, we also looked at lag time, so the difference which we defined as a difference between the time at which the ATV reached its maximum angle and the subject reached their maximum torso shift. Um, so we determined that also for each ride. And generally, subjects shifted more slowly in response to upward pitch movements during the second ride as compared to the first. About 43 milliseconds uh, slower. And uh, there were some other kind of common things that we saw. For, so for, for the roll um, uh, changes, we found that uh, unlike upward pitch, they actually um, shifted less during the second ride and actually did that sooner by about 159 milliseconds. So, but they're very consistent um, from all five uh, subjects. So we didn't really know why these their differences between the first and second rides uh, occurred. And we really felt that additional study needed to determine whether active riding and the second rides were closer to the optimum for maintaining operating vehicle stability or if there was other factors involved. So we didn't have what the forces were on the 
on the handlebars, on the seats, and the footrests, um, which one of our limitations. So we did feel that our study provided proof of principle for the use of ATV simulation with motion capture technology to study active riding, and it demonstrated that there were common patterns or responses among experienced adult ATV operators to which the active riding of other groups could be compared. So like inexperienced riders, um, youth, um, if you're intoxicated, if you have a passenger on, uh, how does that affect your active riding? So we had some limitations with this uh, uh, simulator. The lack of pressure sensors over key areas of the operator contact um, was a big disadvantage. Um, there was lack of visual cues to match what was happening on the ATV with what you know the visual cues were. Um, the software used would not allow the addition of acute severe acute movements to the ride files without this kind of oscillation of movement back and forth as I described earlier. So all of that made it not really as realistic as we would have liked. So that gets to this project here um, and the, the grant we received from Safer Sim, uh, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, with this project, we really wanted to make some significant improvements in our ATV simulator design and function. We wanted to assess the new simulator's ability to measure operator vehicle dynamics and then determine the tolerability of virtual reality goggles versus a wall-mounted screen. So I'm going to talk about those three things here for the rest of uh, the discussion here today. So advancements in the ATV simulator design, we really wanted to improve functionality in the instrumentation of this, the, the simulator and really make it a much more realistic experience for the operators. So to do this, we uh, bought a, a Yamaha 350cc utility ATV. Um, a variety of pressure sensors were added to the handle grips, the seat uh, on the fuel tank, just if people gripped it with the sides of their legs, and also on the footrests. And then sensors were kind of tested to verify their ability to successfully measure counter forces exerted by the operator in response to acute changes in the vehicle's position. Um, a lot of this type of testing took a lot of time and effort by the team. Uh, really the engineering team, not so much by me. Uh, uh, there was, we uh, kind of developed a, a unique, unique vehicle platform con configuration. So basically there was a, a tire pivot uh, that was designed and fabricated and attached to the election motion system platform. And so the tires fit into this pivot system and it allowed the simulator to affect a, a little more natural movement of the vehicle's wheels with um, realistic re, uh, resistance and fric friction when turning the handlebars. So um, we didn't have that with our other vehicle because it was just kind of, uh, well, not welded, but it was connected firmly to the platform. In addition, there was a um, kind of at the bottom of the, uh, of the simulator, the connection to the platform um, was kind of, I wanted to get a picture of that, but unfortunately I didn't have one. But it kind of allowed, uh, prevented the, the, the ATV from overturning or sliding. Uh, but it still allowed really one or more of the tires to lose contact with the platform surface if there was enough movement to the side, um, which as we uh, do more studies on it, we think it's important to be able to determine you know, when the, uh, the tires lose contact as uh, potentially when a person might be gonna, uh, about to lose control of the ATV. So uh, virtual reality, we wanted to provide a more immersive experience for the uh, people on the eighth simulator uh, to give really a realistic sense of motion visually and that the train traversed in virtual re reality would really be reflected in the vibrations and movements experienced by the ATV simulator so that it really had, um, it was all interrelated and made sense uh, and, and realistic to the, to the, to the rider. And we achieved this by creating a virtual test course using Unreal Engine 4.9 software. So, um, so in addition, uh, I mentioned about the problems with the platform and the, the software and, and not being able to like have the, the vehicle move and, and then come back to where it should be instead of kind of oscillating. So we did find out we were able to purchase some, uh, install some software that uh, allowed the platform to accurately and realistically reflect the changes occurring in the virtual reality environment in real time. So this is really was a, a critical component of making a, the vehicle um, really a much better simulator and uh, ride for the, for the operators on it. 
and then uh, perform integration and fine tuning of the throttle, brakes, and turning mechanism. You know, so this all related well with the platform software, software and also the Unreal Engine uh, software. So um, I think Jake uh, is on uh, the line. He's, uh, you know, he could probably tell you a lot more about this so uh, <laughs> than I could, but. <laughs> Uh, I hope I'm doing a go okay job, Jake, in describing this. Okay, so um, so this component integration really was critical. It allowed for the vehicle movement within the virtual environment um, that appeared and felt more true to life and matched the operation of the ATV by the subject. Here's a, a, a little, I stole this, uh, Jake, from a video you made. And, and uh, oops, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just going to head to... Sh So I thought I'd just take that snippet from the video Jake showed because it shows a little bit about the, the platform, how it moves, and um, the ATV. Unfortunately, this uh, little sn snippet here doesn't have the ATV actually on it. It has another uh, apparatus on, but you get at least a chance to see how that electric motion system, system kind of uh, is, moves in six degrees of freedom. So the visual component of this, a screen was constructed to uh, project the simulator's virtual reality environment. And we also purchased an Oculus Rift virtual reality headset, which we uh, tested and integrated as part of the simulator. So um, yeah, this is just kind of uh, the virtual reality headset kind of thing. You get this imaging going to both of your, your ear, your eyes. Um, all right. So, um, so we wanted to, to uh, provide proof of principle that our improved ATV simulator could effectively determine operator vehicle dynamics and identify operator postural control. So to do this, we, um, uh, these active riding parameters were quantified using motion capture technology, accelerometers, uh, gyroscopes, and pressure sensors. And so um, our study subjects included six adult male, uh, males, 18 to 45 years of age. They had to be five feet six to six foot two and weigh between 160 and 220 pounds. Again, we wanted uh, um, riders who have experience, uh, again, greater than or equal to 100 hours of uh, riding experience. And some exclusion criteria included non-English speaking or previous diagnosis of um, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or if they had a positive screen uh, with uh, on an on-site tool in the lab. So nobody was excluded for, uh, for that. And also, 24 hours prior to the study, subjects were asked to refrain from alcohol, recreational drug use, and any over-counter medications uh, that might affect alertness, like diphenhydramine, like Benadryl. And they filled out a written questionnaire, as well as did, we did some anthropometric uh, measurements on them. Uh, the uh, subjects had to wear a helmet, uh, long pants, kind of have closed shoes. Uh, a harness system was attached to a safety line securely connected to uh, the ceiling. Um, there's a picture of that. And then um, uh, subjects were instructed to depress the emergency button between the handlebars to stop simulator uh, if, problem, if they felt they had problems or felt unsafe. Uh, in addition to that, investigators closely monitored the subjects uh, during their rides and it had the ability to stop the platform if there was any concerns. And there was no problems really, uh, safety, or nobody really got to the point where they really lost control or fell off the vehicle or anything like that. Um, passive reflective markers were placed over bony landmarks, landmarks, including the pelvis and spine, on the helmet for their head, and also on the vehicle. There was accelerometers placed on the helmet, uh, C7, uh, at the base of the neck, pelvis, ATV, and the uh, simulator platform. The, um, uh, the subjects received some orientation to the simulator and uh, some safety instructions before the ride. 
And then they are actually allowed to do a practice trail ride just to kind of familiarize the subjects with the simulator so they kind of get a sense of how to do it before they did the first ride. And uh, subjects then performed an experimental program ride first. Uh, the ride was done with the visual um, input projected on a large screen. And then we, they did it again wearing the Oculus Rift virtual reality headset. So the experimental trail ride included platform movements with inclines up to 25 degrees and uphill, downhill, and side hill kind of position. Uh, curves and 90 degree trail intersections were present. They also had obstacles like a tree branch on the trail that they negotiate. Um, and then uh, we utilize vibration ride files to simulate speed and acceleration. And subjects were react, basically react, asked to react to the simulator movements as they would if they were operating an actual ATV. Uh, so to capture that uh, uh, information from the uh, um, reflective markers, we, we had a, 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 a Vicon motion capture system that include 12 intra, infrared cameras with the resolution of 0.3 megapixels per frame each. They were used to track subject and vehicle movements during the ride, and data was collected at the camera's peak capture rate of 200 hertz to optimally capture the high-frequency components of the motion signals, which were then low-pass filtered at about 16 hertz. So um, this uh, mean age was about 24 and a half years. Mean height was 69 and a half inches. Weight was uh, mean was 179 pounds. Um, looking at these subjects, they all, uh, the average starting age was at nine years of age. Subjects, uh, all the subjects' families own an ATV when they're growing up. None of the subjects uh, own an ATV presently. Uh, the younger people, uh, ATVs are expensive. <laughs> um, uh, average number of hours estimated riding an ATV over a lifetime was about 620, but you can see there's quite a range uh, in experience. And over the past five years, uh, about 137 hours um, on average. So um, this is the part where not having Salam here uh, or Jake or somebody like that might be a little dicey, but I'm going to try to give you just some, what are some of the things that we can, t uh, we're able to kind of measure with this new simulator. So we're going to concentrate on the time period between 90 and 94 seconds here. And this graph uh, gives some of the data related to forces measured over the handlebars. And the top graph, uh, or I should show the bottom graph shows the, the force on the right handlebar. You can see there's this huge spike um, at about just about uh, around 93 seconds there. Um, and basically there's nothing on the left handlebar. So it's, there was some really significant force put on that right handlebar. Um, right at that point. Now, this is a, a looking again at the top of the handlebar versus the bottom of the handlebar, and you can see that that in that right at that time period, almost all the forces on the top of the handlebar. So this was kind of shows that the person was pushing down on that handlebar pretty hard right at that time period. This is looking at forces at the footwell at that same time period, and now, one of the things I have to kind of look at closely, I, I didn't show, show that, it's, I mentioned that in the last view, but unfortunately the, the y-axis values are different for some of these. So, um, so here you can see that the forces on the bottom are much higher than the, the forces on the top that we're graphing here. And in that 90, right at 90, you can see that there is some pretty significant forces um, you know, uh, on that right um, footwell, uh, three times that that was occurring on the left at that point. So this is data from the accelerometers. And <clears throat> again, there's some differences in the y-axis here as far as meters per second squared. Sorry about that. I didn't make these graphs, so I apologize for that. Uh, it would be a little bit easier if they were all on the same kind of axis as far as the amount of, of um, acceleration. But you can see there's a kind of a peak <clears throat> in 90 seconds there uh, that's happening. Um, with the head acceleration, or it was almost 20 or even a little greater than that, where those, all those other accelerations as far as the pelvis and the table itself are 15 or lower. This is uh, data from the gyroscopes looking at angular velocity. And again, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in this one we actually see that uh, the, in the pelvis in the bottom graph, that there's some right at, you know at 92 there we can see some pretty significant increase in forces um, with uh, angular velocity of the pelvis that are occurring right at that time period. 
So this is um, uh, some additional data that's kind of comparing uh, angular velocity of the head versus the pelvis, the, and the second graph, head versus the platform of the, uh, that the ATV is on, and then the, um, the last one uh, looks at the pelvis versus the platform. And uh, probably the, the biggest thing I would kind of mention, I should be using this, uh, should have been using this, pointing these things out earlier. Apologize for that. That, that would have helped a little bit. But here's, um, you can see that there's a, a pretty significant increase here in this angular uh, difference between the head and the pelvis as far as angular velocity. So um, we're getting a good sense of what kind of is happening right at that moment in time um, on the ATV. So this I'm going to show you, uh, I showed you some of our um, motion capture um, data earlier. Here's some motion capture uh, data that was happening uh, just before uh, that we're talking about, and you'll see the movement right at the very end of this will be um, that time period we were talking about. The top part of that is actually, uh, the, it, it looks like a kite there, but the very top of the, the kite is uh, uh, basically markers that are on the, the head. Um, that uh, yellow, the bottom part of the kite, uh, point of the kite there is uh, the C7 or seventh vertebra, vertebral, seventh uh, cervical vertebrae um, uh, reflective marker. And then there's some additional ones along the spine. And this kind of, uh, one here that's horizontal, that's actually on the platform, the sensors on the platform of the, that the ATV sits on. Or actually, that's on the ATV. Apologize for that. Yeah, those are on the actual ATV. Okay, so um, this is kind of data from those uh, sensors. And you can see uh, the red is um, the movement of the head, uh, either backward or forward. So this kind of upshift here in that time period, just at, right at this 90 seconds, was happening um, in the head going forward. And then also going, looking at this uh, left or right, we can see that it's actually traveling to the left. So looking at all the thing movements that were going, so um, there was more force on the right handle bar on top as well as the right foot rest, and the head and was moving forward and to the left at the same time. Well, um, there's a lot of analysis to do on this data, um, but the preliminary data demonstrates that we can quantify active riding parameters using our present simulator. And that pressure, pressure sensor data really provides a more uh, complete picture of operator vehicle dynamics and will help determine point at which generated forces might overcome compensatory mechanisms, thus leading to rider loss of control. You see, some of these forces, like for a kid, may not be able to really keep that grip if that, uh, with that force being generated. Um, Oops. Um, okay. So I, the last thing I want to talk about quickly is the tolerability of the virtual reality goggles versus a wall-mounted screen. Um, many of you, if you're doing simulation and using any of these kind of things, are probably realize the problems with virtual reality sickness. There are a variety of things that may contribute to this, but one of the primary causes may this be a kind of visual and vestibular mismatch. So the vestibular system involves sensory organs in the middle inner ear that helps maintain balance and spatial orientation. And if what that is experienced isn't quite matching up with your visual input, that can be a problem. So um, we measured the symptom subject experience when projected images were displayed utilizing the Oculus Rift goggles versus a, a large screen. Um, to do this, we did a, a wellness survey, which had 18 symptoms that they ranked by four different levels of severity, including none, slight, moderate, and severe. So those are the 18 things, but you can see general discomfort, fatigue, headache, eye strain, salivation, sweating, nausea, difficulty concentrating, blurred vision, dizziness, vertigo, burping, vomiting, other kind of problems. So a variety of different symptoms that could develop when you're having virtual reality sickness. So the wellness surveys are completed initially then after the screen, so after they did the simulator ride with images projected on a large screen, and then post Oculus Rift. So after doing the ride with the Oculus Rift goggles, they did another wellness survey. For scoring, each symptom received a number, zero for none, one for slight, two for moderate, and three for severe. The total scores for each survey were determined, and the most common symptoms experienced were noted. 
Uh, five subjects completed all surveys. Somehow, um, one failed to complete the Oculus Rifts, uh, post Oculus Rift survey, so it had to be excluded, so that was unfortunate. But um, the initial survey, there was a score of only one. So, of all the you know, five subjects, uh, one reported slight sweating, so they were feeling fine. Uh, post screen survey, uh, total was seven. Almost all of these were reported to mild sweating. Um, several subjects noted they felt the simulator lab was a little bit warm. Um, so being in there a little bit and being on the simulator, they felt a little, they were kind of having some symptoms of some mild sweating. Uh, but after the post, uh, after the Oculus Rift uh, ride, um, the total score was 27. So it increased um, a fair amount. Um, and the symptoms uh, uh, with the greatest increase post Oculus versus post screen included nausea. So if there was a total score of five more in the five subjects, eye strain, difficulty focusing, dizziness with eyes open, and general discomfort. So all these symptoms, uh, even though they were increased, uh, were rated as slight by each of the, they weren't, none of, the only one that was moderate was nausea in one subject. But still, there probably was some changes with being on the, uh, using the Oculus Rift compared to um, just doing it by screen. So certainly their um, subjects tolerated the simulators better with use of the screen uh, for visual input. Uh, for future ATV simulator, uh, we probably will either utilize a more immersive screen environment or try to find a uh, goggle system that's less prone to this kind of virtual reality kind of sickness kind of problems. Um, even though they weren't severe, some of the people um, that were on this more like Kyle Losick, who did a lot of uh, preparing for the subjects, um, he had complaints that he had some problems with uh, headache and thing that much that lasted a lot longer um, for many hours afterwards. So, um, yeah, so that's our bike simulator here. That's kind of more of an immersive screen environment to do it. So we could do something like that with the simulator as well. So in review, uh, simulator-based technology is a powerful and safe tool to address research questions related to ATV operation that really can't be tested with other methods. Uh, our simulator provides a unique and powerful methodology to investigate dynamic response of ATV operators to acute changes in vehicle angle and acceleration. And improvements completed with the support from Safer Sim Grant made our simulator a much more realistic ATV riding experience and markedly improved our ability to measure active riding parameters. Um, this simulator is now able to determine uh, the movement of riders as well as the forces generated by riders at key points on the vehicle. And with these data, we'll be able to identify thresholds of instability that could lead to loss of vehicle control an ATV crash. So that's about all I wanted to present today. I guess I took most of my time, but uh, I think we're good to open it up for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I wish my engineering colleagues, I guess I guess maybe uh, Jake is, uh, maybe Jake will be able to answer them if I can't. Uh, yeah, Jake is still on. He's actually sent a couple of messages and a, a YouTube video. Um, <laughs> so he is, he can be a resource. Um, if you want, you can exit out of the screen share. Right here? Yep. Right? Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. Okay. I think Jake's typing something now. Let's see what else. Oh, <clears throat> Thanks, Jake, for adding that um, uh, to the uh, chat here about the, the YouTube video. That's great. Chuck, do you think it would be beneficial to um, maybe run a study with some children or teens on um, the simulator. I know you mentioned they might not have the physical strength to actually do the active writing that you know an adult might be able to. Yeah, so really, um, that's what we really want to do is, you know, there was a lot of work on this project and, and money that we had to use for the Safer Sim grant to really get um, this, this new simulator to a point where we could actually use it for subjects. But the goal would be to, um, further design projects where we actually measure certain specific things that are risk factors uh, with the simulator, which would include um, looking at active riding and see 
uh, like comparing these uh, experienced riders with a, a inexperienced rider and see how they negotiate a side hill, how they negotiate a sudden uphill or downhill kind of movement. Um, and then uh, you could look at like in a, you know uh, if there's alcohol, you know, and how that affects a lot of the ATV crashes in adults uh, have alcohol involved, and obviously that plays a factor, and that may be this is affecting their ability to really do effective active riding, but. I, as a pediatric emergency medicine physician, I really want to look at kids and see how that varies in, in looking at how passengers, how what that uh, does to uh, affect active riding. And so we can really kind of illustrate to people why this is important, why we need to do other things to um, even an ATV design to make it less likely for a passenger to be on it. If you look at an ATV right now, that seat looks really long. And it doesn't need to be that long. We've done some studies that that really doesn't need to be in that. And being able to show this might help uh, influence manufacturers and seat design. Um, but uh, also even just making decisions, we can use this to help you know in writing an environment and how kids decide where to to cross a road because a lot of these you know um, are crossing roadway roadways, and even if they're not on the road, they're crossing the road um, just like riding a bicycle for a kid and things like that are really dangerous kind of things. Again, showing that this isn't uh, having kids being able to, to cross the road. It's probably not a good thing. You know, um, They can't make those decisions to do that safely. Thanks, Jake. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess we'll give it one last uh, chance for any questions, but I think it was a great presentation. Um, I want to thank everybody who was online. Uh, uh, thanks for, for listening, and I uh, appreciate your attention. All right. I think we'll wrap it up with that. Uh, we'll, we will get this online within the next couple days, so if you want to share it with any of your colleagues, uh, you can find it on the Safer Sim website and our Safer Sim YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and just like Chuck mentioned, thanks, everyone, for joining, and we will see you at future webinars. Thank you.